Friends, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Martin Laverty, and it being 3.30, we will commence our afternoon session. By way of introduction, uh, I am in my day job the Chief Executive Officer of Catholic Health Australia. Catholic Health Australia uh, is the advocate, if you like, for the 75 not-for-profit hospitals and the 550 aged care services that are operated by different arms of the Catholic Church right across Australia. In my other roles, uh, I am a not-for-profit board chairperson uh, of the Heart Foundation in New South Wales, and I sit on the National Heart Foundation National Board. I also serve as a board director of the New South Wales Public Service Commission, and in that role I represent the interests of not-for-profit human service providers. And uh, more recently I was appointed a director of the National Disability Insurance Arrangement, uh, Disability Care Australia, the government agency overseeing the rollout of the NDIS. So I, I come to this discussion with those varying backgrounds, uh, but I leave them all at the door because today I'm speaking in my capacity as a PhD student to present to you the academic work that I've been pursuing for the last two and a half years, some of which I was able to describe at this conference uh, in this room 12 months ago. Uh, by way of indication, I wonder were any of you at that discussion uh, 12 months ago? At least I see one hand in the air, two down the back. Some, came back. <laughs> you came back for more. So some of the material today builds on what has been presented previously, but it's actually tested and more rigorous, I'm pleased to say, than perhaps it was presented in its preliminary form last year. Now one of the questions uh, that uh, I have been asked regularly uh, is uh, can the information that uh, I'm going to share with you today um, be used within organisations? Is there any copyright around what I'm doing? I'm pursuing a, a PhD for public benefit. So it's available for download right now. If you wanted to type in betterboards.net forward slash one or two dot pptx, you can download this presentation and you can rate me as I go through it, or it's certainly available on the website at a later time. And I'll come back to this uh, web address at the end of the discussion if you'd like to capture uh, those details once again. The PhD that I'm pursuing is specifically looking at how boards of directors can better contribute to organisational outcomes. If, as a not-for-profit director, you want to ensure compliance with the law, follow the ACNC's guide and the new legislative arrangements on how to run a not-for-profit organisation. If you want to ensure best practice of your board governance, follow the AICD 10 principles for best practice in not-for-profit governance. However, if you want something more, if you want to focus on how your board directors and how your board as a collective can improve the organisational outcomes of your board's contribution to social purpose. Today I'll present to you a 12-step framework that can be applied at your boards to be able to focus on organisational outcomes. The reason I've started pursuing this research is having sat on boards, uh, not-for-profit boards, for in excess of 15 years. And in the first phase of my uh, directorship as a a lawyer just out of university, I was focused on legal compliance. In the second phase of my period as a board director, I was focused on best practice governance. More recently, I've recognised that even with really good groups of people, with good skills mix coming together, you don't always necessarily get the board contributing to the organisational outcomes or growing the social purpose or the social dividend of the organisation. So that started my thoughts around, well, is there research in Australia of the not-for-profit sector that tells us how governance can improve social impact? It perhaps won't surprise you that there is no detailed research on not-for-profit governance in Australia, and there's certainly not independent academic research that looks at how you can contribute to social outcomes. Therefore, it was very easy to persuade a university that this was an area in which a PhD would contribute to the body of knowledge. But as uh, supervisors require when you come up with a PhD topic, they require you to narrow and focus. So the focus of the work is within human service not-for-profit organisations, not-for-profit hospitals in particular, that use two-tiered governance. 
And the use of two-tiered governance in Australia is more common than is perhaps first apparent. I was asked um, before starting this uh, discussion by someone who then chose to leave the room, what is two-tiered governance? Because uh, that individual hadn't perhaps come across it before. Well, we best know the two tiers of governance in Australia through the wide use of federations. And what we draw from the academic literature is that federations face an extraordinary tension in trying to change their governance structures to improve their efficiency to focus on their core purpose. The board that I chair at the National Heart Foundation works within a federation. We are perhaps a case study of one of those organisations that's spent a profound period of time. In fact, some 15 years prior to my joining that organisation, work had been underway on trying to balance the powers between the national board and the individual state and territory <coughs> boards. So federations are very common across Australia to the way in which not-for-profit organisations work. Also common to those federations are tensions between where decisions, autonomy and power balances sit. So what I'm going to detail in this presentation to try and answer the question of how can a board of directors better contribute to the organisational outcomes, particularly within two-tiered governance structures. But as I work through this, you'll see the methods are just as applicable to unitary or single boards within not-for-profit organisations. I'll focus first on what we know about the scale of the Australian not-for-profit sector. It's important to regularly remind ourselves of the important contribution that the not-for-profit sector makes to the Australian community. I'll then very briefly touch on the academic theories that underpin the practice of governance within the not-for-profit sector. We'll then talk briefly about the very complex and misunderstood area of what determines success for not-for-profit organisations and how can you as boards determine your own method of what success for your organisation looks like. And then I'll get to the 12 steps previously drawn from academic literature that instruct how a board of directors can better contribute to organisational outcomes. And I'll leave you with a framework that you can take back to your boards for debate, consideration and possible application. And if you think this framework is useful for you, you might be interested then in participating in my ongoing research about whether or not this theoretical framework in practice improves the organisation's social impact. So we all know that the Australian not-for-profit sector contributes significantly to the Australian community. There's almost 60,000 economically significant not-for-profits in Australia and some 600,000 not-for-profit organisations of various definitions. Importantly, not-for-profits employ 8% of the Australian working age population and contributes 4% of GDP annually. In a room like this, we perhaps don't need to be reminded of the importance of the not-for-profit sector because we are all here because we are part of it. But the importance of the contribution made to the Australian economy of the not-for-profit sectors underlines why a focus on improving governance is urgent and timely. If we think about the theoretical and academic underpinnings of how not-for-profit governance is practiced, the literature first tells us that governance is that mechanism whereby those who provide capital guarantee that they get a return on their investment. In its simplest form, governance is how to ensure that for an outlay there is a return. Specifically to the not-for-profit sector, what makes the not-for-profit sector unique to the for-profit sector is that non-distribution constraint that prohibits profits from being distributed uh, back to shareholders or the providers of capital to those not-for-profit organisations. The further complexity is that the stakeholders of a not-for-profit organisation become what in the literature is referred to as the multiple principle. So there is in fact a shareholder of a not-for-profit organisation, but they're not someone who has a receipt for having contributed their purchase of share in the for-profit organisation. Instead, they are the donors, the volunteers, the consumers, the beneficiaries, 
the staff members, the members themselves, and the board directors. The academic literature recognises that the shareholder base of a not-for-profit includes that extraordinarily diverse group of people. Staff, consumers, donors, volunteers, all with a say and a stake in the interest of the not-for-profit organisation. Not necessarily with a legal right, but certainly a personal interest that as directors of an organisation, directors need to be aware of engaging with those multiple principles. Very different from the dynamics that sit in a listed company where it is the shareholders who vote at the AGM that the responsibility is perhaps held back to. If we move from that academic theory into the practice of not-for-profit governance, we first see that governance is the design of a set of institutions that involves boards and committees to induce management to act on behalf of the donors or those who have provided the resources to the organisation to achieve its social purpose. Yet the challenge, and this is a challenge that I alluded to briefly yesterday, is that the governance structures we utilise in Australia, those underpinned by corporations law, associations law, or most recently the very vague ACNC Act, are informed by the design of for-profit governance structures, not purpose-built for the not-for-profit sector. So what we operate with in Australia is in fact a relic from those industrial times in England when the owners of cotton mills, the providers of capital, were setting up structures of governance, boards to oversee the mills in pre-industrial and post-industrial England to ensure that the managers of those mills didn't steal their income or assets along the way. I ask the question, how appropriate is a governance structure designed in that social circumstance for the operation of not-for-profit organisations today? Is it refined sufficiently to meet the interests of not-for-profit organisations in Australia? We also see that whereas in the majority, most governance structures in Australia are unitary boards or single boards, there are variations of how governance is practised in Australia. So some organisations are governed through two-tier boards, federations, subsidiary arrangements. Not-for-profit governance research is particularly limited in this area, but we see a growth in very complex governance structures that are evolving away from that industrial English model to better shape the circumstances of having multiple principles where the shareholders are, the donors, the staff, the volunteers, the consumers or care recipients of an organisation. That's why research on these varied uh, governance structures is important to understand that best practice governance is actually being achieved. So what then does the literature define as two-tiered board governance? Well, the traditional understanding of two tiers is where two boards, of one organisation have separate roles from each other. And you might start to see some of the lessons of that happening. Successful two-tiered governance clearly separate roles and responsibilities. Where federations in Australia are showing themselves to have tensions, there is not necessarily a clear separation or indeed consensus understanding of how those roles are properly separated. The literature says that the two-tiered structure sees a supervisory board or the higher tiered board acting on behalf of the shareholder and then the lower board act as the management or on behalf of the principal. So a very clear definition between these two structures, particularly within federations, is that important lesson. The literature does, however, notice a difference between subsidiary boards, traditional two-tiered boards and federations. But the lessons are the same. Whilst the literature treats them differently, we draw the same lessons from all. The use of two-tiered boards uh, itself had uh, its origins at the same time that England was developing its mechanism of overseeing the cotton mill, so too did the Germans at the same period come upon this notion of having 
two structures to oversee a single organisation. German law now requires as mandatory two-tiered uh, board governance within its for-profit and its not-for-profit organisations. That Germanic template is used widely across Central Europe, in Latin America, and more recently as China has turned its eyes to the West, so too has it adopted two-tiered board structures into both its government-owned enterprises and increasingly into international-based organisations that operate in China. For the first time, and uh, I, I would like as a, a, a dorky academic researcher some type of drum roll, for the first time today, I'm able to indicate that 20... Thank you, I appreciate your support. 22.6% of not-for-profit hospital boards in Australia are themselves governed by two-tiered board structures. So some 6,500 not-for-profit hospital beds um, are governed by two-tiered board structures. My PhD work is focusing quite narrowly on the not-for-profit private hospital sector because it's an easy sample group to work with because of this uh, presence of a quarter of NFP private hospital boards utilising this two-tiered board structure. But I'm using it as representative of those federations, of those other organisations that also use two-tiered board governance structures. And where it's perhaps most commonly found within Australian not-for-profit organisations is in church organisations where you might have trustee ownership, ownership of assets and then a delegation of managerial responsibility to a corporate board. So that's the focus of how to get these two tiered board structures working most effectively. Missing from the understanding of many not-for-profit boards and I accuse myself of being guilty of this particular misdemeanour, is the absence of a commonly held understanding of what success for an organisation actually looks like. In order for a board to properly operate, it needs to know the purpose that it's seeking to achieve. So the academic literature uh, perhaps isn't really all that helpful in resolving that uncertainty. The, the literature says performance of not-for-profit organisations is a social construct and assessing the contribution that an organisation makes actually depends on who you ask. Not particularly helpful. What's commonly used are accounting and market measures as the key methods of determining performance. So as you've sat around your own not-for-profit board tables, I'd suggest to you you've looked year on year. Uh, is your revenue growing? Uh, it's a, a, a financial indicator <coughs> of an organisation's success. But if you're looking year on year to financial growth, are you setting yourself specific targets? Is a 10% year on year improvement the target that you're working towards? Or is it a stretch target that says year on year we want to achieve growth of X? Again, unhelpfully, assessment of some 150 academic works uh, in the decade leading up to 2006 said that the common measures of performance were this efficiency or productivity assessment, the market share that an organisation might have within a particular geographic community, how much of the customer base does the not-for-profit have, what is um, customer satisfaction and finally what is quality. These four indicators of efficiency, market share, customer satisfaction and quality from those 150 academic works tend to be the most common measures that sophisticated not-for-profit organisations are using to assess their own effectiveness. So pausing there for a moment, that is perhaps if you like the introduction to the research that I am undertaking, but the real benefit or hopefully the real purpose of this research is to provide guidance back to not-for-profit boards on how they might change their practice, enhance the way they go about their work or recruit directors to their organisation to ensure that they are contributing to social impact, that they are in fact expanding the contribution that the organisation makes to the Australian community. So the first of the 12 steps, perhaps not unsurprisingly, is that a board must guarantee basic board functionality. It might sound obvious, but the board has got to be able to function before it has any chance 
of being able to contribute to a social outcome. Now the board's contribution to value creation best occurs when board directors individually and, co and collectively are able to understand their board role. So do all of the directors around the table have a sufficient understanding of their board role? And what um, Australian researchers Nicholson and Keel tell us is that effective boards have four roles of monitoring, providing strategy, providing advice, enabling access to capital, and when all of these are combined, they're going to influence to board effectiveness, which leads on to organisational outcomes. So the first step of this 12-step process is that the board must ensure its own basic functionality. And I suggest the easiest way of doing that is the adoption of and the good practice of the AICD uh, 10 principles for not-for-profit board practice and uh, an understanding of the new obligations of the ACNC Act. The second of these 12 steps that the academic literature tells us will help contribute to organisation outcomes is that of monitoring its own performance. The board should determine what it requires by organisational performance. It has to set itself a measurable metric or have a consensus understanding as to what improved performance looks like and then it has to measure against those targets. Not-for-profit status means it's very often unclear as to what the goals of the organisation might be and how the organisation and the chief executive in particular is going to work towards achieving that social impact. Again, in my own experience as a chief executive, in my own experience as a board director, I can admit to decisions and periods of uncertainty, whereas the chief executive, it's not clear what the board is asking me to pursue. And as the board chair, it's particularly difficult to get consensus among directors as to what success look like and how in turn staff might work their way towards it. If the board doesn't define what its performance of the organisation is to look like, the chances of the staff being able to implement a pathway to good performance is going to be set back. The third of these steps, the board's composition needs to be designed around the needs of the organisation. Now some of the observations that the literature gives on the composition of the board are both politically incorrect and uh, not exactly what we would expect to hear. The first is that a swag of American studies and uh, European studies tell us that in for-profit corporations the use of independent directors doesn't necessarily add value to a corporation's performance. So let's, let's translate that. An independent director in the literature is someone bought in that doesn't have ties or mission commitment to the organisation. There is a great focus, particularly uh, post um, Enron, post HIH in Australia, on the presence of independent directors on for-profit and not-for-profit boards. There are legal reasons for that focus on independence. But what the literature tells us is that the independent board doesn't perhaps have a good functional understanding, a good business understanding of the organisation on which that director is sitting. So the literature is pointing us to say that when you're thinking about comprising your board, the traditional method and declaration of interest, I'm a lawyer so I love it when uh, the first thing that a board looks for is to appoint a lawyer before they move on to the accountant and more recently on to the marketer. Well that traditional practice is perhaps not exactly what the literature is telling us is working. The board that is comprised with directors who understand the business, who have a mission tied to the business, is a board more likely to be contributing to organisational performance. So here comes some of the flaws in the particular academic theory that I'm putting to you. The balance between legal responsibilities and ensuring that you have those able to fulfil that compliance, together with those that understand the business, is something that comes into the proper composition of the board. Board diversity, something that is um, promoted in our, in our last session when we were discussing whether or not board directors should be paid, there is a very strong proposition put that board diversity is something that we should all be working towards in Australia.
Well, a study of some 6,000 firms uh, in the period between 1991 and 2003 found no causal link between board diversity and organisational performance. So in pursuing uh, pr policies of board diversity, and I'm again proud to say that it, in my roles as board chairman at the National Heart Foundation and uh, previously in a disability organisation, I pursued the implementation of a board diversity policy and have achieved at the National Heart Foundation a 50-50 balance, a 50-50 gender balance on that board. I think that's a very important thing to do. But what the evidence is telling us is that board diversity in and of itself is not necessarily going to contribute to organisational performance. Uh, a view commonly held is that smaller boards uh, contribute to better oversight and management is actually supported by the academic literature. So the smaller the board, the more likely the contribution to organisational outcome. Now the literature is not particularly helpful in being specific as to how small, but it's indicating if you add these three dynamics together, the board needs to be comprised with those that have a mission tie or an understanding of the business. It doesn't necessarily have to be a diverse board, but if it's a small board, you're likely to have that successful contribution to organisational performance. Turning to the fourth step, strategy. Strategic engagement, uh, one of those motherhood statements that applies um, to all good governance is proven out through the academic literature. But what it tells us is that, regrettably, most boards have been found in practice not to be deeply involved in strategy setting. That in practice, it is the CEO that drives most of the strategy work, and very often it is the board that is simply adopting, ticking, or agreeing with the path that the CEO pursues. So that if strategy directly correlates to organisational performance, how do you better engage your board in those strategic discussions? So that where the board is better engaged in strategic thinking, uh, not in competition with, but in partnership with the chief executive. There is academic literature that says that board will be better contributing to organisational performance, but the reality of governance today is that most boards themselves are not as involved in strategic decision making as ideally they would be. The fifth step, participation. The evidence from the United States once again, and that's supported in the United Kingdom, is that a participative board has a greater correlation with better financial indicators. Organisational effectiveness has in fact been found to relate to the confidence in which a board director understands their responsibilities. And that particular study, the Herman study of 1985, said that it's not enough to have just a handful of confident directors on the board, that in order for the board to be fully participative, the confidence of all directors needs to be attended to. I'd invite you to reflect on your own boards and those that sit on it. Are there some directors more confident in their role, more able to speak up and more able to exercise their function? What role does the entire board have in ensuring that those perhaps less confident directors are enabled to participate more fully. Is the training program in place? Is the chairperson running the meetings to ensure that the overconfident don't dominate against the less confident? We go further into our understanding of um, participation and we again um, find some particular uh, challenges here. Gender balance doesn't necessarily, in and of itself, lead to a greater uh, participative board which then turns into greater organisational performance. The Brown and Hillman study of only last year says that gender balance on boards, or in fact where there are more men on boards, who have greater experience as a not-for-profit director on other boards are more likely to contribute to organisational performance more so. Now, I, I have some challenges with this particular piece of evidence, but if you unpack it to understand it, we know in Australia in particular that today the more experienced board directors, because of years of practice, happen to be men. 
because of the opportunities that men have had in years past, because we haven't had a focus on gender diversity until recent years. At the moment, you have the bulk of directors with experience on other boards, coming to boards, with um, the background of being a male. We see a change in that starting to happen as boards are working towards the implementation of gender balance. And I think it's more likely that if the Brown and Hillman study was undertaken in five or ten years, you would see that experience that men have as directors today starting to balance out as more women have developed longer standing as board directors in greater numbers. But the evidence says to us right now that uh, the participative board is better served by those with previous board experience and that group of people tends to be male at this particular point in time. The sixth of our 12 steps. The not-for-profit board needs to reward ownership. And I sat uncomfortably through the debate about remuneration of directors before this session, being aware of the overwhelming academic evidence that where the board director has a financial stake in the enterprise, they are more attentive to their board function and then in turn that directly links into organisational performance. So from the for-profit sector, we see that where a board director has stock ownership within the organisation upon which they are sitting, there is a greater likelihood of that board contributing to overall operating performance. We see further that directors um, are not necessarily sufficiently rewarded for their board functions today. So that we can conclude directors who are not sufficiently remunerated or not remunerated at all lack the incentive to contribute fully to their board role. Let's explore that anecdotally. For those of you working with our voluntary uh, NFP boards, and I sit on the Hart Foundation as a volunteer and have done so at that organisation for eight years, I see a very different anecdotal engagement of directors there than the two boards that I sit on that are remunerated. And it's not just about turning up and turning on. The remunerated board is undertaking a job. The remunerated boards, in my experience, anecdotal as it is, is that performance management is undertaken. Performance managing a volunteer is a very different aspect. So the academic evidence is actually encouraging us as a not-for-profit sector to work towards this challenging debate. Are we sufficiently rewarding ownership of directors who sit on our boards? Martin, sorry, if I can just add something at the totally opposite end of the spectrum. I'm on a board, I'm an international board, which is based in the US, and board directors are expected to contribute to the organisation, and that also focuses the mind. We ascertain at the level at which the, at which the director must make a contribution is sufficient to cover the costs of running the board then, which is about ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year. You so that each board member should either give or get ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year in order to satisfy your KPIs on the board. Now that also focuses the mind in terms of I now have an investment in the board every year. And so I feel a bit of ownership, but because it's at the opposite end. I, I'm noting that you haven't downloaded <coughs> this particular presentation, so you haven't got to steps eight and nine, no. which go to that very point, <laughs> which we'll get to. Step seven, before getting to eight and nine, uh, is that of transparency. Um, those boards with a transparent approach to the practice of their governance, i.e. the board that is accountable about its governance is more likely to be contributing to organisational performance. Favourable accountability assessments, as just has been noted, leads to greater donor support of not-for-profit organisations. But the type of, uh, or the willingness of a not-for-profit board to be accountable in the first place is in fact determined by a combination of its own strategy, its capacity uh, and its contextual engagement with its stakeholder groups. That is code for coming out of the Saxton and Go study. Uh, one size does not fit all. 
So the literature is not saying how a board should be transparent. It is simply saying that the board that is transparent about the practice of its governance, as opposed to the financial performance of the organisation, that they're two quite different things. So I'd ask you to think how many of your boards now issue any statement to your members, your consumers, your uh, funders about the practice of your governance as distinct from your annual report which talks about the performance of the organisation. Now again, I admit my own deficiencies. My Catholic Health Australia board will be issuing its first governance practice statement as a result of this academic literature that is telling us that better contributes to organisational performance. In having raised this issue in one of the other not-for-profit organisations uh, I am engaged with, we are years away from being confident enough to talk about the practice of our governance because of the combination of our strategy, the capacity, the contextual engagement with our stakeholders. So one foot size will not fit all, but the more transparent a governance practice, the more likely the contribution to an organisational performance. Now the point just raised is that where a major donor sits on an organisational's board, they are more motivated to participate in governance which leads to improved organisational outcomes. So it's perhaps the other way of putting that proposition. If you come onto this board, you will be expected to donate. Therefore, you have a financial stake in the success of the organisation. Therefore, you're more motivated to contribute through governance to growing the organisation. But similarly, where a donor comes onto that board, they are overseeing their own stake in ownership in the success of the organisation. So that if you think about your own organisation, who are the principal funders of the organisation that you might be involved with? And this leads to some interesting questions. With, majority, uh, with perhaps the majority of NFP human service organisations in Australia being either almost entirely funded by government, or if we think of an aged care organisation funded by a combination of government subsidy and consumer contribution, either through the provision of capital through an aged care bond or the payment of fees and charges for the provision of services, do the boards of directors take that approach to having among them a representative of either of those types of interests. I'm not promoting government representation on aged care boards, but I'm proposing that where a board is focused on its organisational performance, it will have some type of understanding of its engagement with those who are resourcing the organisation. Step eight, or nine rather, similarly, um, where board directors themselves are engaged in resource gathering activities, however that is defined for the type of not-for-profit organisation you are, and particularly the making of the personal contribution, there is more likely to be greater participation on the board and in turn a greater contribution to organisational performance. So again, apply this type of thinking to the type of organisation that you might be. If you are entirely funded by a state, federal or a local government, are the board of directors involved in resource gathering? Are the board of directors involved in engagement with that government funding process? Either as advocates, as lobbyists, as uh, liaison with the local federal MP to ensure the importance of the relationship with the government for a future decision that might be made about funding. We can take this academic literature and turn it into something very practical for boards of directors. I know the reality is that boards of directors uh, do the opposite to what was proposed from the US, and they say it's not the role of the board director to be involved in securing the funding for the organisation. It's delegated down to the chief executive. That's fine, and that's a decision that a board can make, but the academic literature is saying that that board is not contributing as best as it could to organisational outcomes as opposed to if board directors themselves were engaged appropriately in that discussion of resource attraction. 
the tenth and uh, near to the final stages of this 12-step process, a board itself needs to be stable. Poor financial performance with a series of not-for-profit organisations has been linked back to high board and chief executive turnover. The more secure and stable the chief executive and board tenure, the more likely there is to be stability, the more likely there is to be improvement in organisational outcomes. In fact, the board's ultimate purpose, according to the Gabrielson study, uh, which is out of Germany, the board's ultimate purpose is to enable cooperation. Cooperation at all levels. Cooperation with funders, cooperation with staff, cooperation between organisation and its end users. Don't misinterpret that as meddling in management. But the board has that function of enabling cooperation. And when it can align its own resources of knowledge, experience, relationships with the procedures of the board, the organisation is better able to achieve its corporate outcomes. And again, that's uh, Nicholson and Keel, an Australian study that is talking about the importance of the board aligning itself with the organisational outcomes. The 11th stage, and this is specific to two-tiered governance structures. So the 10 steps up until now are generic to single-tiered or unitary boards as they are to two-tiered boards. But these final two stages are specific to federations, uh, to two-tiered governance or NFP subsidiaries. And what it tells us is that where the senior board, the supervisory board, uh, at least in Germany and Austria, have been found to be truly independent from the management board, you are likely to see greater organisational performance. Larger and active supervisory boards, and in this case the Firth study defines large as anything greater than five, which I would suggest for most not-for-profit organisations is tiny, but any board larger than five, and that which is active, is going to help improve the returns of the social enterprise. And similarly in China, we see that active and large supervisory boards have been found to associate with financial performance. So what we can take for this for federations, um, for subsidiaries or genuine two-tiered <coughs> boards in the Australian uh, environment is that proper delineation of responsibilities and a genuine independence of the senior board, separation of powers, if you like, is crucial to the success of an organisation being able to function sufficiently and contributing to organisational performance. Where in a federation in particular there is role confusion, you see barriers to improved organisational performance. And the final step, also applicable only for the two-tiered structure. The supervisory board needs to have a professional match that relates it back to the organisation's purpose. And this is similar to one of the earlier stages in looking at the board composition or the board makeup. It's not enough to simply look for the lawyer, the accountant um, and the marketer to sit on the board. The professional link, the mission attachment of the board director back to the organisation's purpose is an essential platform for the contribution to an organisation's performance. So over the course of the last uh, 45 minutes or so, I've imparted a fair amount of academic literature and every statement that you've seen presented to you on the screen before you is drawn from um, academic evidence to support the claims that I've made. And what that looks like in practice, and I won't expect you to be able to read this, is a framework that boards can take back to their organisations to apply in their own local circumstances. Twelve steps that I saw someone counting, twelve steps that marries them uh, back to the proof in the academic literature for those boards that are wanting to improve their contribution to organisational performance. Now this framework differs from the uh, mandatory requirements of governance for the ACNC, those five governance principles. It differs from the ten 
best practice principles enunciated by the AICD, because both those structures are talking about what is mandatory for the ACNC's governance arrangements, what is best practice for the AICD. Here, this framework is saying, you've got to do both of those. You've got to tick ACNC compliance. You've got to tick uh, uh, best practice through AICD eyes. But in addition, if you want to be growing your social impact, if you want your directors to be working towards improved organisational performance, you also would be best to implement from the academic literature this 12-step framework on how boards can themselves contribute to organisational outcomes. All of the references to everything I've seen today are available. I give a prize to anyone who can cite the second from the bottom. And anyone who is interested in a further discussion around this framework, um, or indeed who'd like to take it back to their organisation and try it out, uh, I invite um, uh, ongoing discussion uh, over the, the 18 months or so that I have left to complete this PhD to see if this academic framework drawn from literature can actually work adequately in practice. And that's what every academic needs to do is present the flaws of the case just presented. This is an academic framework not yet tested to see if it actually does what it's designed to do. That's what the remainder of my PhD is about, testing it in a selection of two TID boards to see if it then results in improved organisational performance. So for those wanting to download this presentation, which I'm very happy for that to occur, and particularly for the framework to work its way back into organisations, betterboards.net forward slash one or two dot pptx. We have um, about uh, 15 minutes or so remaining for our session. It will be over for many organisations to move straight into a two-tier two -tier, um, model of governance. So I'm just wondering if you can what the tipping point might be, at what point the organisation could be really useful in utilising yes. Well, I'll, I'll give um, uh, the, the three different answers um, that uh, exist to that, because uh, in this capacity I'm here as an academic, so I therefore have to reach for multiple mm -hmm. answers, some of which will disagree with each other. Um, the first, uh, perhaps, is derived out of the common use of the two-tiered board structure in Australia. Um, there are two illustrations of that. There is the federation, those organisations that exist because um, they want to uh, put themselves through the pain of working as a federation. And uh, we, we have to thank our forefathers for giving us that constitutional framework of states, territories and the Commonwealth that informs why federations exist in Australia. The other common use in Australia is for church organisations where there is a separation between the legal ownership of assets. So where a, a church has historically owned a set of assets and it might be um, a, a head of a church that themselves doesn't want to run the enterprise and they put in place uh, an operational board. So it's like the relationship between trustee uh, and an accountability for the fulfilment of purpose, uh, but then a group of um, perhaps corporate uh, directors are put in charge of operating the enterprise. And the not-for-profit hospital uh, is the best illustration. I can name some of those that comprise the um, quarter of NFP hospitals, and perhaps given my work background it won't surprise you that um, St Vincent's Hospital here in Melbourne is governed under a two-tiered board structure. St John of God Healthcare here in Melbourne, uh, Victoria, governed under a two-tiered board structure. Uh, Cabrini Health, which you might know um, at Malvern here in Melbourne, not governed under a two-tiered board structure. So a not-for-profit hospital that's just not made that same type of decision. The question asked in the PhD research is why, in the Australian context, have that decision been made to choose the two-tiered um, uh, two structure? And it, in those illustrations of St John's of um, SVA, it's a separation of mission ownership and then operational ownership. So the trustees take on the responsibility as the supervisors of the mission. Are we fulfilling the mission? And then the directors of the corporation are delivering the uh, oversight of the operation. And the successful ones, I won't name names now, but the successful two-tiered structures in NFP hospitals, 
work when there is clear delineation of role. Where you don't get that clear delineation, you get some trouble. So the advice I'd give is before choosing that two-tiered structure, um, have a purpose for doing so. What do you want the superior board as opposed to the operational board to do? And then clearly define which does what. Right, just ask, I was going to ask about the definitions. Okay, so with the two tier model, and I'm trying to figure out the benefits and you just made some, uh, I'd like to know where the legal liability sits um, in relation to the trustees and the directors that the organisation is providing. Yes. Um, and how different is that from the single tier with board subcommittees? Yes. So the legal responsibility is shared. This, and there are two reasons for that. Um, the first is that the practice in Australia is that the two tiers both themselves become uh, companies uh, limited by guarantee. So that both of them actually have that same corporate law or now AC, uh, ACNC um, type of obligation. So the legal responsibility is shared. But also in practice where boards have tried to separate responsibility for different legal functions. And, and some of the uh, illustrations that I am studying in this research have deliberately separated out legal responsibilities. As the lawyer, I'm looking at them and saying, well, the law of shadow directorships means that despite your separation on paper, if there was ever an incident that brought a matter to the court, the, the courts would need to define whether the law of shadow directors kicks in to uh, capture all directors, be they on the supervisory or the operational board. Now, the same is true of many federations. And I think this is not, in my experience, well understood. It's certainly been my anecdotal experience on one of the federation boards that I work, that directors thought, because they had separate companies and a superior company telling a junior company what to do, that there was separate legal responsibility. The law of shadow directors, section 181 of the Corporations Act, kicks in to say, you're all in it together, all in it together. So the purpose of setting up two tiers is certainly not about separating legal risk. What it's seeking to do is bringing a very defined role as to who does what with more contribution to an organisation's social purpose. What would your advice be to an existing federation that has its two-tier government structure? Get rid of it. But who <laughs> well, exactly. I was going to say, who is considering getting rid of the two-tier structure? Do it quickly. So the, the reason that I <coughs> pursued, the very deliberate reason I started this research was having sat at a board table of a federation, and I've been involved as a director of three different federations now, so I'm not pointing the finger at any one of them but looked around the room in each of these organisations and found really good people, really good minds, brilliant people, but no common understanding as to which level had responsibility for what. And all of the, the forced um, infighting that our structures force us into, the, the blame game between state governments and the Commonwealth government is no different to many federations. And I, I haven't come across too many directors in federations who advocate the use of the federation as a really harmonious way of doing business. Rather, the federation exists because it's the lowest common denominator compromise. So I, I can't say enough, and I'm walking away from my academic role now to being having lived through it. Are there examples of federations in the room other than associations that exist for the advancement of a membership purpose that actually work. So I, I, I don't know if I would correctly describe um, uh, perhaps uh, AXA on behalf of aged care organisations or LASA as federations. I don't know if that's a good description or not. But their, their purpose is, is advocacy. But even within those organisations I see some tensions between uh, state and territory boards as to what the advocacy position is and separately how to go about it and what are we saying and how are we going to say it. So my anecdotal experience is, is the Federation rarely works. Um, also in Australia the Federation boards tend to be the representatives of the state. So it's not as if it's an external government right. by capital. That's right. 
So, but what, what the academic literature is telling us is that to give the Federation the best chance of success in writing and in practice, there must be the clearest agreement on the separation of roles. And where there is that separation of agreement on who does what, you are more likely to succeed. But what I've seen in, in the federations in which I'm involved is you might get it right at a point in time, you might get it right in writing, and then personnel change brings in new ideas, new personalities, and the movement for merger or the, the shift between national and state power comes back again. I don't think the federation serves us well, uh, and the academic literature gives some tips as to how to make it work better. So the, the, the literature is telling us is that we're a um, human service organisation, so an, organi an NFP that is delivering a service, where directors come to that board without an understanding of the nature of the service delivery or the service environment. So the, the, the lazy illustration might be to say, don't put an airline pilot on the board of Meals on Wheels because they don't relate to or have an understanding of what it is to deliver Meals on Wheels. So that the functional background of the director that understands the business, the literature is telling us they are more likely to be able to contribute to the organisational outcome. But there's a few dynamics. The person can come to the board and not understand it, but then they gain that understanding along the way and they become an effective director. And I'd go further, and whilst we don't see it in the academic literature that I'm, I'm aware of, um, the role of the uh, uh, community representative is actually one of those multiple principal shareholders. So in fact, the community representative on a not-for-profit board is in fact probably a shareholder um, as opposed to fitting into that category of someone who doesn't understand the business. But it's also, there's an obligation on the organisation to bring somebody in who doesn't have an understanding to induct them to the organisation make sure they do have the opportunity to explore what the business is. That's exactly right. If you don't do that, then I think it's a failure of the organisation and the board. Exactly. If there's no final questions, um, friends, thank you for joining us. I hope this has been uh, useful. If you would like further engagement, um, you'll find this presentation and that will enable you to find me. If anyone would like to take this, free ticket to dinner is taken. There we go. Thanks very much, friends.